Hey everyone, Noah Zerby here. This is one of a series of short videos looking at the European Union. This vo video focuses in particular on the idea of functionalism and neo-functionalism as they relate to the European Union. So let's go ahead and get started. To understand the role of functionalism and its importance for the European Union, let's start at the end. In June of 2016, the United Kingdom voted 52% to 48% in a popular referendum to leave the European Union. The vote marked the culmination of months of campaigning and debates over the importance and the impact of the European Union on life in the UK. During the campaign, leading up to the referendum, there were some interesting videos produced trying to sway public opinion either for or against EU membership. The Leave campaign focused on the idea of British sovereignty and the threat that EU represented to that sovereignty, as well as to the economic costs of membership. The Remain campaign focused on the benefits from EU membership, and because the idea of functionalism relates to those benefits, I want to show you one of those videos now. It's a short video produced to support the Remain campaign, spoofing a group called the People's Front Against Europe, and asking the question, what has the EU ever done for us? So let's see what they come up with. Fuck the Euro! They're blairs, white the bastards. They've taken everything we had. And not just from us, also from our fathers. And from our fathers' fathers. And from our fathers' fathers' fathers. Yeah. Yeah, and from our fathers' 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 fathers. All right, we got the point. The question is, what did they give us in return? Ecta. What? Ecta. They put an end to that anti-pirating bill. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, they put a stop to it. They reduced the roaming costs. Yeah. Remember what we used to have to pay? Okay, 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 I'll grant you. The rejection of the actor and the low mobiles are things the EU has done for us. And the good condition of the roads. Well, obviously the roads, the roads go without saying. I mean, apart from the roads, and the rejection of the actor, and the low mobile cost, what has the EU ever done for us? A Europe-wide uh, student exchange program? Common environmental standards. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. That's good. yeah, that's fair enough. I can visit my sister now in France without a visa. Yeah, that's something we'd really miss if the EU were to span a wretch. Yeah, and we can work or live anywhere in Europe without any special permission. Yeah, and there were the only parliament to allow Edward Snowden to testify. Oh boy, you know how afraid the national parliaments are of America. We can make a stand against the NSA by ourselves. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But apart from the actor rejection, and the roaming costs, and the roads, and the exchange programs, and the... The common environmental standards. Right. The original subsidy, the open borders, the possibility to work everywhere in Europe. The and consumer protection. Yes, the consumer protection, and this hearing of Snowden, and the data protection. Apart from all these things, what has the EU ever done for us? Huh? Brought peace? Peace, peace, oh shut up! So I think what's interesting about the list they develop is how broad it actually is. While the Leave campaign is focused on philosophical objections to integration centered on British sovereignty and autonomy, British identity sometimes framed in terms of opposition to immigration, and the idea that an unelected bureaucrat in Brussels is dictating British policy, the Remain campaign is focused on many of the practical benefits of EU membership. The video we just saw points to several of them, expanded protections for consumers, focus on individual privacy, easing travel restrictions across Europe, establishing common standards and billing practices, and so on. Ultimately, the Leave campaign was successful. Months of political struggle and intense negotiations in both the British Parliament and between the United Kingdom and the European Union followed. But after several years, on January 31st, 2020, the agreement was ratified and the United Kingdom was officially out of the European Union. But what does this have to do with functionalism in international relations? Or more specifically, what exactly is functionalism? Functionalism is an idea first advanced by the Romanian-born political scientist David Mitrani in the 1930s, most notably articulated in his two main books, The Political Consequences of Economic Planning and The Progress of International Government. Mitrani was a liberal theorist who was interested in thinking about how greater cooperation, and thus peace, could be established between states. The idea he advanced was known as functionalism. Functionalism argues that rather than focusing directly on movement towards a system of international federalism, the integration of states into a supranational union, we should instead focus on progress in areas of technical cooperation, 
in areas like coordination of international mail delivery, transportation safety, weather forecasting, and so on. In these areas, cooperation between states is likely easier to achieve because there appears to be relatively little in terms of political, military, or economic power at stake. But as states achieve cooperation in these technical areas, cooperation in other areas becomes easier and more likely. Thus, according to the argument presented by functionalism, successful cooperation between states in the least competitive areas of technical agreement will make cooperation in increasingly more contentious areas easier and more likely over time. Further, as cooperation between states in technical and economic areas progresses, the pressures of nationalism and competition decline. States are increasingly able to restructure or pool sovereignty, and for Mitrani, because nationalism and sovereignty are the root causes of war, the pressure and likelihood of war is reduced. What's more, functionalism contends that the territorial form of the state is ill-suited for addressing contemporary global problems. Thus, for functionalists, a peaceful world society can gradually be created through pragmatic technical cooperation. The functionalist argument draws heavily from the liberal vision of international relations and frames itself as an alternative to the power politics of realism. And if we look closely, it's not hard to see why. In terms of the goals of states and other actors, realism posits that the driving force of state behavior is conflict, survival, and military security, while functionalist arguments frame the driving force of state behavior as the pursuit of peace and prosperity and contend that these objectives are best secured through cooperation. Realists contend that states may use economic instruments and military force to achieve their primary objective of security, but functionalists counter that political acts of will, that is, of cooperation, may also be an important tool available to policymakers. Realists argue that the agenda of global politics centers largely on threats to security of the state, and that shifts in the balance of power represent the most important topic in global politics. Functionalists counter that a focus on areas of low politics, that is, of economic, social, and especially technical issues, is critical because it can develop the consensus across a broad array of issues, potentially transforming rather than simply maintaining the existing global order. And finally, with respect to the role of international organizations, realists assert that the role of international organizations is sharply limited by the power of the state. That is to say, states will permit international organizations to play a role only insofar as they advance state interests. Once they cease to do so, states will curtail the ability of international organizations to play any meaningful role in global politics. Functionalists, by contrast, assert that international organizations play an absolutely central role in global politics. Functional organizations, like the World Meteorological Organization or the International Postal Union, among countless others, are increasingly responsible for formation and implementation of policy. This role can limit state sovereignty in important ways, but it also creates a context within which international cooperation can take place. The neo-functional approach emerged in the 1950s, partially out of the thought of Jean Monnet, one of the leading figures pushing for European integration through the European coal and steel community. Neo-functionalism takes many of the foundational beliefs of functionalism, but grounds them at a regional rather than a global level. Further, neo-functionalist approaches place a central emphasis on the idea of spillover effects. Put simply, neo-functionalism argues that initial decisions by national governments to grant authority to international organizations and to pursue cooperation in particular areas may necessitate further integration and cooperation in related areas. And so those areas require further cooperation in a third area, and so on and so on. This is usually referred to as a spillover, and this spillover effect exerts pressure in two related ways. First, it has an expansive logic. That is, cooperation in one area creates pressure for cooperation to broaden and expand into other areas. Second, the spillover effect may also create pressure to further deepen integration within the original sector. As an example, we can think of the process of establishing a customs union under the Treaty of Rome in 1957. Remember that a customs union is simply a trade block in which the member countries agree to permit free trade between them and to establish a common tariff framework for trade into the region. But the creation of a customs union in 1957 created pressure to establish a system of exchange rate parity which would deepen the connections under the customs union. 
it also created pressure to establish a common currency, which would entail coordination of fiscal and especially monetary policy across the Union, an example of broadening. Further, integration of policy in one area may develop connections between actors with similar goals and interests in the various state outside of the immediate political realm. For example, coordination of coal and steel production under the ECSC meant that German and French coal producers, coal miners, coal processors, and so on, all came to have similar interests as their counterparts in the other country. Coal miners in Germany shared interests with coal miners in France, and so on. Transnational interest groups began to view their interests framed not at the domestic level, but at the regional or the international level. Now, on the one hand, neo-functionalism seems to explain some of the key elements of European integration fairly well. Early focus on technical areas of cooperation did indeed spill over to economic integration, first through customs union, and then through greater levels of economic coordination and integration, and finally into monetary union and the Eurozone. But the process of integration has hardly been the unidirectional vision of progress as neo-functionalism suggests it would be. Indeed, there has been pushback against integration, beginning with broadly Eurosceptical views and then the rejection of the Lisbon Treaty and culminating, at least for now, with Brexit. So where does this leave this? Does neo-functionalism help us understand European integration? The answer, I think, is yes, but there are real limits. So that concludes our brief introduction to neo-functionalism and the European Union. Leave your thoughts on functionalism below, and thanks for watching. Have a good day. Bye.